You know what the scripture says about laughter? That uh, in some in uh, Proverbs chapter seventeen and and verse uh, twenty two, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But uh, Proverbs seven twenty two tells us that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. There are several authors that have written books about laughter and about joy in the heart and the benefits of it. And that's what we're going to, I'm going to give you eight things. If you got a pencil and paper, you want to jot some of these down very quickly. You can do it in shorthand. And then I'm going to go back and discuss these. So uh, uh, these are some things that uh, are in this book, uh, how to be up on down days. There's so much good through this thing. And these things are so good that I want to share that with you tonight. And she shares in this chapter, uh, some things that Chuck Swindoll, most of you probably have heard of Chuck Swindoll, uh, in his book that he wrote uh, concerning laughter, as laughter being a good medicine, his book was entitled, Maybe It's Time to Laugh Again. If you uh, want to read a good book with some fun in it, well, uh, that'll do it. Uh, but eight things that uh, benefits, the benefits of laughter. And uh, you may not have uh, given this much thought, but number one, he mentions this, laughter helps us to stay physically healthy and to fight disease. Laughter is like an internal aerobics. Our circulation and heart rate are improved. Our blood pressure is lowered. Our immune system is strengthened. We're distracted from pain. Those are all positive things on laughter. Number two was, I know you didn't get all that written down, but just uh, laughter and health is all you need to do, abbreviate that. Number two is laughter improves our relationships. Uh, everybody knows me, knows that I'm gonna try to be as light as I can and, uh, and uh, cause people to laugh as much as I can. And of course, like uh, Ron always says, if you want to see something funny, just look at the preacher. I mean, that's enough to make you ha ha. But laughter is, is good. Uh, it's good medicine. It's good for our relationships to be able to laugh with one another, not only just cry and share with one another, be able to laugh with one another. And then number, uh, Three, he says, laughter restores our energy and interest and stimulates our creativity. And number four, laughter helps us enjoy life more. Laughter, number five, laughter relaxes us and lifts our spirits. Number six, laughter makes us more flexible and optimistic. And number seven, laughter gives us a needed break from the pain of heartache. I, I know some people today that are just hurting over some things that they just can't turn loose of. And uh, laughter is so important and a merry heart. So someone that they can share with that can help them in that area is, is a great benefit. And then number eight, he mentions laughter helps us to deal constructively with problems and difficult situations. There are several different things in here that I want to share with you tonight that were very interesting to me. She begins the book with talking uh, this particular chapter on laughter, uh, lighting up with laughter. Said uh, she looked uh, she looked like an army drill sergeant. Now she always was talking about was an airport restaurant waitress. So it looked like whenever she came through the back door to take an order, it's, 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 she was gonna come to your table, okay, I want your order now. <laughs> kind of, that kind of attitude. Well, one of her clients, one of her customers was a mild mannered, distinguished looking, gray haired pastor. Now that's the way old gray headed pastors look like anyway. Isn't it? <clears throat> so, who had been the featured speaker at a large gathering in the city the day before. He was taking an early morning flight back to his home. On that particular morning, he may have been sleepy or preoccupied with thoughts of his day's activities. 
At any rate, the burly waitress evidently perceived him as tense, even door, because as she descended on his table, she said in a loud, gruff voice, lighten up, buttercup. When the pastor told that story at a recent gathering, the participants were convulsed with laughter. In the first place, the thought of such a distinguished gentleman being called Buttercup was so ridiculous that it was funny. Even uh, more humorous was the fact that he told it on himself. And with such vivid description that we could see that substantial woman and almost smell the coffee. She poured as she made uh, that impertinent remark. As I have reflected, she says on that incident, I've come to the conclusion that in a world full of pressure and deadlines, most of us would do well to lighten up and laugh more. Now I gave you that passage of scripture in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22, which I refer to quite often because <clears throat> it just, it's just very fitting verse of scripture, the merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So the Bible encourages laughter. There's several areas and I'm gonna share a few of those with you that uh, we see the humor uh, in the scripture that uh, should cause us to smile or even to laugh. And uh, she shares the story of Abraham and Sarah. Now, you know where this is going. I've always enjoyed the biblical story of aged Abraham and Sarah doubled up with laughter on being told they were going to have a baby <laughs> at their age. Even God laughed with them. The miracle child who was born to them was named Isaac. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. Often I've wondered if the creator of the universe does not laugh when we strut around with feelings of imperial self-importance and self-sufficiency. He must, however, be saddened, more saddened than amused when we forget our dependence upon him or when we forget that we, like Abraham and Sarah, can accomplish unbelievable things when we claim his promises and seek to fulfill his purposes. There's nothing that our God can't do. And the point of it all is the fact that God wants to do his miraculous work through us. So perhaps many of us should hear him say to us, lighten up, buttercup. Dr. Charles <clears throat> Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll, as most of us know him, writes in his book, maybe it's time to laugh again. He says, <clears throat> God's sense of humor has intrigued me for years. After all, he made you and me, didn't he? And what about all those funny looking creatures that keep drawing us back to the zoo? God must have smiled when Elijah mocked the false prophets on Mount Carmel, asking whether their gods had gone on a long journey or, or fallen asleep or were indisposed. And he says, what about uh, the fella Eutychus who listened to Paul preach and fell out of the third story window. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor in that scenario. He talks about Solomon. Solomon reminds us that even in laughter in Proverbs 14 and 13, if you want to jot these scriptures down, even in laughter, the heart may ache. The humor but humor gives us a needed break from the pain of heartache. When we forget our dependence upon Christ or fail to remember what we can accomplish through his power, we need to lighten up. 
and heed Paul's words that he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. In his book, The Humor of Christ, Elton Trueblood tells us that Jesus said it's impossible to enter the kingdom of God unless we become as little children. Mark 10, 15 is this passage of scripture for that. He points out that a part of childlikeness is playfulness and the ability to laugh. Even Christ had a sense of humor. His humor often involved paradox such as the blind lead the blind in Luke 6, 39. And exaggeration as is found in Mark 10, 25, it's easier, you know this, for a camel, you know the rest of it, don't you? Easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, these things that <clears throat> the Lord uses and these humorous type things, they were not used, Jesus didn't use these things to cause one to have great laughter but in a sense to lighten up, uh, he wasn't a stand-up comedian. And what he used in saying things such as this was to emphasize a truth that we needed to understand in, in the application where that particular thought was used. And most of all, and the most important thing, that Jesus emphasized the importance of joy and balanced living. In John chapter 15 and verse 11, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that joy, my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. There are some things that we can laugh at and, and uh, uh, things we can't laugh at, but yet they don't destroy the joy that we have in our hearts because of the presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives. Laughter as good medicine. Again, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. The power of laughter has been taught through the ages. In recent years, the physical benefits of laughter have received a lot of attention. Norman Cousins, who served as editor of Saturday, Saturday Review, for many years laughed himself back to health. Think about that and wrote about it in the anatomy of an illness. He witnessed the curative power of laughter in dealing with his life-threatening illness. Part of his rehabilitation <clears throat> regimen was to rent old Laurel and Hardy movies and watch them for several hours each day. Not only was this a distraction from pain and a spirit lifter, but it actually helped to strengthen the immune system. Later, he was invited to join the staff of a medical school where he helped patients understand the role of positive attitudes and laughter in their recovery. A lot of physical benefits of laughter have been studied and been documented and that's what has taken place in this, this book. But laughter, <clears throat> he says, can lower your blood pressure and heart rate. Laughter, can lower <clears throat> your stress level. Laughter can improve relationships and emotional stability. Laughter can improve diaphragmatic breathing, improve the flow of blood to the brain. In addition, you will enjoy life more and be more fun to be around. We've talked about moodiness and how some people are so moody that 
And I've seen some people, I think uh, their face would break if they were to smile. He said, I know of a woman, <clears throat> listen to this now. I know a woman whose husband was killed suddenly in an automobile crash. They had three children. Both parents were persons of great Christian faith who practiced joy and laughter in their daily lives. Though the family went through a period of grieving after his death, the mother was able to continue some of the fun things they had done as a means of remembering him and coping with their grief. So laughter helped them to erase uh, the pain that they were experiencing. So three simple steps to laughter that uh, Chuck Swindoll shares, and uh, these I think would be worthy for you to write down. Uh, he says the biggest joy killers in life are worry, stress, and fear. So we can't control a lot of the circumstances in our lives. We can, with the help of God, control our reactions. And that's what we're responsible for in life. If we're fearful and stressed out, worrier all the time, we can begin to laugh by following three simple steps. Number one, look for humor. Look for humor in everyday life. If we look around, we can always see something that, if you don't, if you don't have anything to laugh about, go to Walmart. You can see a lot of folks there that just make you ha-ha. And then also some that make you wish they had stayed home or you had one. But Chuck says this doesn't mean telling jokes, but creating a state of fun or play. Comedian Steve Martin says that he gets his laughter juices going each morning by looking at himself in the mirror when he first gets out of bed, which he says is good for about three or four minutes of hilarity. Of course, it wouldn't be healthy to laugh at our physical appearance every morning, but we can begin each day with laughter and carry a light spirit throughout the day. Motivational speaker and author, Mamie McCullough, a lot of you have heard of her, has a marvelous ability to see humor in everyday events. <clears throat> she endears to readers herself to readers and audiences by the ability to laugh at herself. I once heard her tell of an embarrassing experience. She explained that after she speaks, she usually goes to the restroom, freshens up and then gets something to eat. When she speaks in her home state of Texas, she travels by car instead of by plane. Her habit is to stop at the nearest McDonald's after speaking. After many such stops, she's learned that in Texas, the ladies' restroom at McDonald's is always on the right side of the restroom. The stops have become so habitual that she even stopped looking at the sign on the door. One day she was speaking in an adjacent state and literally ran into a nearby McDonald's. Automatically, she turned in the restroom on the rack. To her amazement, four men were in the room. As she told about this incident, she said, I don't know why I felt I ought to explain, but I did. The only thing I could think of to say was, my husband just left me and I'm looking everywhere for him. Comedy in a bad situation. My husband and I received many church bulletins. Now I know a lot of you have seen the church bloopers and uh, this is right down the alley for Marsha. Marsha, where are you? She can catch those bloopers. I'm I here. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. 
I, I receive many that. church bulletins and enjoy reading the bloopers from typographical errors or sentence construction. For example, some of you have probably read these because I've shared them with you, but the choir will meet at the Larson home for fun and sinning. Not singing, but sinning. This afternoon, there will be a meeting in the north and south ends of the church and children will be christened at both ends. I see some of you smiling. Smile at someone who is hard to love. Say, and they meant to say hello, but they left the oh walk. Say hell to someone who doesn't care much about you. And then for those of you who have children, these are church bloopers. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> There's always something humorous around us if we'll just look for it. All we have to do is just open our eyes and have the right attitude to look for those things that would bring a smile on our face and lift laughter. Then number two, he says, is this. When you feel yourself getting irritated or angry, count to 10 and then try to see something ludicrous in the situation. Of course, all of these have illustrations in them, so I'm going to share these illustrations because they're meaningful. <clears throat> this will either clear your perspective or help you to deal with the situation more calmly. Either way, you'll realize that whatever it was, it was not worth getting upset about. In 1987, at the American Football Conference playoffs, the Denver Broncos were playing the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. It was near the end of the fourth quarter. And Cleveland had just scored. They were one touchdown ahead. Only one minute and 57 seconds remained in the game. At the next kickoff, Denver fumbled the ball on its own one yard line and spectators assumed the game was over. Denver fans groaned and bemoaned the loss. Hostile Cleveland fans threw dog biscuits on the field. Even the announcers were speculating about who Cleveland would play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Timeout was called and John Elway and the Broncos went into a huddle in their own end zone. In that tense, seemingly hopeless situation, Keith Bishop, the all American left tackle said with a twinkle in his eye, Hey guys, <laughs> now we got them just where we want them. It was such a ludicrous statement. <laughs> that the whole team burst out laughing. One player laughed so much that he fell on the ground. In that moment, laughter relieved anxiety and tension and infused the team with calm confidence. What followed has become known in football annals as the drive. The Broncos regained the ball, drove down the field to score in the last seconds of the game. They won the game in overtime and went to the 1988 Super Bowl. Can you imagine? You football fans can. And down on the one yard line and in your own end zone. It has been said that laughter is our best weapon and the one least used. It is true. How many of us consciously use humor to relieve tension and help us deal with problems. This is not in the book, but have you ever heard the statement, it's better to laugh about it than cry? You know, whatever the situation might be, might as well laugh about it. And then the last thing, and that kind of fits into this category that Chuck Swindoll mentions is this, number three, remember that some of our concerns 
or much ado about nothing. You've heard the saying, making a mountain out of a molehill. Their outcomes will make no difference in 10 years. Though we must right the wrongs, the weight of the world is not on our shoulders. God is still in control. So we can laugh and love and trust God for the future. Early one morning, I was at work in my office at the church. Suddenly the door flew open and in walked a young woman. <clears throat> sobbing uncontrollably. Sally was one of the active young adults of our church. She was attractive, intelligent, had a good job, had just celebrated her first wedding anniversary. Judging from her sobs, I thought she and Tim must have a serious relationship problem or that someone close to her had died. Finally, when she was able to stop crying and talk, she said that she and Tim had not been included on the guest list for a big party given by the supervisor in Tim's company. This must mean that Tim isn't going, doing well because everybody else in his department was invited, she said. Also, we had this couple to dinner just a month ago and now they've snubbed us. It's just not fair. Then I asked her, are you sure that you and Tim are the only couple in the department who were excluded? No, she wasn't sure after all. In fact, she knew of only two in the department who were invited. Then this had nothing to do with Tim's competence or reputation at work, I suggested. And she nodded. And haven't there been times, I asked, when you couldn't ex include everyone you'd like on an invitation list? Of course, she said, but we had the couple for dinner just last month. Suddenly she grinned and said, guess I'm just dealing with hurt pride. I smiled and reminded her, well, the pain of rejection can be very real. And all of us have to face it from time to time. By then she was able to look at things more objectively. She straightened her shoulders, dried her tears, and headed out for another appointment, calling to me, thanks for helping me to see that this was not the end of the world. As she left, I thought of how often we spend hours worrying and crying over something that won't matter at all 10 years from now. Incidentally, Tim later became president of that company. <laughs> Learn to laugh at yourself. We receive a subtle but wonderful benefit from the benefit ability to be able to laugh at ourselves. It helps us to see ourselves in proper perspective, to realize that no matter what our credentials, we are not the center of the universe. When I was first married, I couldn't cook. Actually, I told my husband this before we married. Later, he told me he had thought all girls said that that so that the husband would be surprised when his new wife presented her first meal. Well, my husband was certainly surprised. You see, when I was growing up, my mother didn't like people in the kitchen when she was cooking. I had washed a billion dishes and done other household chores, but I had never put a meal together. Three weeks before I was married, mother was stricken in her conscience. She took me into the kitchen and taught me to make one meal. <laughs> it was fried chicken, 
mashed potatoes, green beans, and congealed salad, orange jello with carrots and pineapple. I do not exaggerate when I tell you that when we returned from our wedding trip, we had the same meal every day for three weeks, except for breakfast. For breakfast, we had cold cereal and toast. But for lunch and dinner, we had fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, and congealed salad. I didn't even change the color of the jello. Even now, when we attend a covered dish dinner, my husband shies away from that orange jello. Finally, one Saturday, he said to me, Do you think we could have baked? chicken tomorrow? Quickly, I replied, of course. You go buy the chicken and I'll bake it. <laughs> While he was at the grocery store, I telephoned my neighbor and asked, Geneva, how do you bake a chicken? She told me some things I don't do now. She said, get out your roaster, put in water, the chicken, salt, and pepper, and then put the lid on. While the oven is heating, turn on the eyes on the top of the stove and set the roaster there. <laughs> the next morning after breakfast, I did everything she had suggested. Then I went into the bedroom to dress for church. My husband was in the study, putting the finishing touches on his sermon. The only thing I had failed to tell my neighbor was that my roaster was glass, not Pyrex. In about five minutes, there was a terrible explosion in the kitchen. It sounded like fireworks going off at Disney World. We both rushed to the kitchen door and that scene is indelibly imprinted in my mind. The stove was steaming, water was running all over the kitchen floor, glass was in every corner of the room and the uncooked chicken was under the table. <laughs> <laughs> I said to myself, I am sure he must be thinking he married the dumbest girl in the world. What's he going to do? What he did was he burst out laughing. It was not a quiet, gentle laugh, but a side splitting one. That sound was wonderful. The whole situation changed. I exclaimed, you look better to me right now than the night we were married, but what are we going to do? The stove won't work. We don't have any money. We don't even have peanut butter. As he put his arm around me, he said, there's just one thing to do, go to church and look hungry. Actually, it must have worked while I was shaking hands with a member after church. He said, we have wanted to take you and your husband out to eat since you were married. Could you possibly go to lunch with us today? <laughs> I had a preacher friend of mine here in East Texas. Matter of fact, he lived right here in Mineola Pastor Church out here. Years ago, some humorous things that he's told me, but a couple of them I share with you, not to go on with the rest of the book, but he, he said he'd driven out somewhere to uh, preach that morning, and he says it about, it's a long time ago now, this is an older preacher too, it's a long time ago, and he said, I drove about, I don't know, 75, 80 miles out to the church to preach that morning and said, normally, you know, someone would invite you out to, uh, to dinner so you wouldn't have to drive back and come back for the evening service. You could just stay the day with them. So he said, I stood around after the service and shook hands with everybody and nobody had invited me out to lunch. Said, finally, one fellow said, well, said, we've got a 
old fried bird at the house to eat. I guess uh, you might want to come along and eat with us. He said, I just believe I will. <laughs> then he had a wedding that he had to do, and it was about a, out in West Texas. Now here he is in East Texas, he had it in West Texas. He drove out there and to do the wedding, said hardly had enough gas to get out there, much less to come back. He went out there to the wedding and said when he got through with the wedding, the guy handed him an envelope and he said, man, I drive away all the way out here and all I get is a card and he just stuck it in his coat pocket. Finally made it back home on the little gas that he had and a few weeks later, he took that jacket out to wear it again and, and there was that envelope in his pocket. He took the envelope out and opened it up and looked and there was a hundred dollar bill in his envelope. He says, as I smiled, I replied demurely, I'll see if my husband has anything planned. Inside I was saying, thank you, Lord, that could have been a traumatic experience for a newly married couple. Instead, my husband's laughter drew us closer and turned the incident into a great conversation starter. A word of warning so that the ability to laugh at ourselves gives balance and perspective to our lives. Laughing at ourselves should never mean belittling, demeaning, or putting ourselves down. The latter can decimate a good self-image. Laughter makes you a better person. Laughter is good, as we said, as a medicine. And so, I, I you know, I, I said right here, and I'm, I'm glad that we've got the ability to be able to see some of your faces. Some of you don't put your faces on there. But as ones that I see on there, I saw some smiles. We need to laugh. Laughter is good. And uh, I'd much rather be around somebody that's got a smile on their face than one that's uh, so moody that never has a joyful thing to share. When we read the Bible, we find things like I shared just a few moments ago, things that we would cause us to smile. We think about the humor that no doubt that, that uh, God knows exactly what we need. And certainly we have crises. We have very uh, difficult times and circumstances in our life. But learn to look on the positive side. Smile and laugh and, and to be joyful in your heart. Because we know that uh, God wants us to be healthy. And laughter is important to our health. A joyful spirit a good spirit. As we approach people, I, I like, you, you all know how I am after 20 years over there, but uh, I don't like to, I, I, there's time to be serious. There's time to be very serious, but there's also in those times of seriousness, as we saw in this book that she wrote, some things that uh, we can find to smile about, be joyful about, even in times of troubled times. Look for laughter, look for humor, and look for joy because it's there, because we have the presence of God in our heart. Well, if this has made you smile a little bit today, well then that's been worth the, worth the time to, to read some of these articles that she had in there. And Chuck Swindoll, he's a character, if you hear him preach, on, uh, you, you're you gonna get some laughter out of him whenever he talks. And, uh, it's a blessing. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your love to us. Thank you, Lord, for your uh, patience. Thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and making us, Lord, who we are as we trust you more, realizing how much joy there is to be found when we look for that relationship and build upon that relationship with you. And as we look to those that are friends and neighbors and brothers and sisters in Christ and 
just find the joy in their hearts. It's a joy to us. So help us, Lord, to lift each other up and to encourage one another and, and to laugh and look in the mirror and just, just see something there that we can laugh about, something that uh, we can see that maybe needs to be done. Do it and then have joy in our heart. This world uh, needs happiness. And happiness can only be found in a relationship with you. So help us as your children to live our lives in such a way that joy and happiness will be evident in our life because of who we have in ours. Place each one who has joined in tonight. And again, we ask a special blessing upon those who have the urgent needs tonight. Lord, that you just bless them with health and strength, comfort, Lord, as you know is needed and give us grace to always say your will be done. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us in Jesus name. Amen.